One of the most incredible processes in biology is how we all developed in this little cocoon of love that we call the uterus. It's amazing that we came from one egg cell from the ovary that eventually met up with one sperm cell from the testes. Now, I would love to stand up here and talk about how much work goes into creating sperm cells. And it is pretty crazy that males produce about 3,500 sperm cells per second. But the female reproductive cycle, or the menstrual cycle, is remarkable. In just about a 28-day cycle, there are dramatic changes in hormone levels. Ovulation occurs, the lining of the uterus gets thicker, and even menstrual cramping. Although most females probably wouldn't consider menstrual cramping remarkable. Either way, today we're gonna to show you how and why all of these changes occur in the female reproductive system, which pretty much allowed all of us a chance at life. It's going to be a fallopius one. So let's do this. Kind of the format of what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually start with female reproductive anatomy, show you on the cadaver dissection some of the major structures, and then I'll actually go back and we'll talk about the menstrual cycle. Hopefully you're excited about that and let's just get started. So let's start with this dissection that we have here. This is a female sagittal section. And just to make sure we're clear, sagittal section just right down through the midline and we're looking into the right side of the pelvis here. So just to orient you to some structures here, here is the actual pubic bone that we have here. You can see the lower portion of the spine, specifically the sacrum right there. And then we also have the anus. But as far as female reproductive structures, here's the vaginal canal, and you can see the probe in. Here we have the beginning of the uterus, specifically the cervix. And then we also have the body of the uterus here. And I should mention the bladder here. For anybody who's ever been pregnant, this relationship between the actual bladder and the uterus is quite important. We'll get into more of that in just a little bit when we talk about pregnancy. But some other really cool structures that we have here is we've got the uterine tube, if I can grab that there. Here's the uterine tube, and you have to look closely because it's actually embedded in that tissue, but you should see the outline of the uterine tube. This is also referred to as the fallopian tube. And then of course, we have the almond-sized ovary right here. So just kind of keep those structures in mind. And what I wanna do is first talk about what's going on on about a monthly basis, and then we'll go back to the cadaver dissection and kind of give you some real examples of what happens during ovulation, implantation, and some really cool processes in the reproductive cycle. So this is again a monthly chart. When you look at physiology texts, they tend to say uh, the typical reproductive or female reproductive cycle or menstrual cycle is about once every 28 days or so. It can vary and there's some normal variations there, but it's nice to kind of just start with a number when you're learning about this cycle and anatomy and physiology. So let's kind of break this into the first half and then we'll talk about a brief little segment right in the middle, and then we'll talk about this, really the second half, but you could say that's kind of the third segment of the whole menstrual cycle. So day one of the menstrual cycle starts with actually ble actual bleeding. And I am gonna jump over to the cadaver dissection here to just to show you this. So again, here is the uterus, and what I'm probing right here is the smooth muscle of the uterus. If you remember, smooth muscle is under involuntary control. And right in there, where I'm sticking the probe, that's the endometrium, which is the inside lining of the uterus. Now, the reason I wanted to jump back to this cadaver dissection is during day one, or when day one starts, it's when menstruation takes place, bleeding. And the endometrium will actually slough off and the uterus will contract with that smooth muscle. And then the endometrial cells with the blood will actually move out the vaginal canal and that's what's essentially responsible for the menstrual bleeding. And that can last anywhere from one to seven days. Some females have it for a couple days. Some have longer and heavier periods that can last up to seven days. And so there's a bit of variation when it comes to that. But what's really interesting about this is all of the hormones that we have here. And so I wanna start with LH and FSH. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing refers to yellow, and I'll mention why it got its name luteinizing a little bit later on. But luteinizing hormone, you can see is highlighted in yellow, and we get this huge spike around day 14. And then we have follicle stimulating hormone, which you can see in more of the green here. It's a little bit superimposed here, but I'll trace it out for you. Here is the follicle stimulating hormone right there. And again, that spikes as well, not quite as high as follicle, or as far as, as high as luteinizing hormone, but we still get a spike. Now, both luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone 
are released from the pituitary gland all the way up in the brain. So this is really cool to think about. They get secreted from the pituitary gland in the brain, enter the bloodstream, circulate throughout the body, and will bind to receptors in the actual ovary, which we can see again right here. So that's kind of a little bit of a journey for those hormones. And I like showing students this because we went from the brain all the way down to the pelvis with these hormones. And what's interesting about hormones is this idea about receptor physiology, or you could kind of think about this lock and key analogy. When you have hormones secreting throughout the whole body or in the bloodstream, that means it could potentially target or affect any cell if that cell has the receptor for that hormone. So why, does not, why doesn't luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone affect other tissues, except for, say, specifically the ovaries? It's because the ovaries actually have the receptors that luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone can actually fit into and bind to and then create a physiological response. Now, kind of think of that as like a lock and key analogy. The luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone are a specific shaped key, and they'll fit in a very specific shaped lock, which would be a receptor on the actual ovary. So this is what's pretty cool about this whole process. What follicle stimulating hormone is going to do is prepare the ovarian follicle. And that's what's shown right here. This is showing you a follicle becoming more and more mature. A follicle is a circular structure right here. Follicle literally just means a bag-like structure. And it's funny because I remember teaching my students this a lot in the past. And when they first heard the word follicle or the words follicle stimulating hormone, some of them would be like, is that gonna stimulate my hair follicles? And that's an honest mistake, it's okay, but we didn't, because most people don't know you have these little follicles actually in the ovary. So it has nothing to do with hair in this situation. But one thing I do wanna mention is this is showing you the development of just one follicle from day one to about day 14. What's really cool is that inside the ovary, every month or so, there's about six to 12 follicles that will get stimulated to grow by this follicle stimulating hormone as it kind of starts to increase right there. And then we get this last spike that I'll mention in just a second. And what happens is even though there's six to 12 follicles developing, typically only one of those follicles fully develops. And they refer to that as the mature follicle or the dominant follicle, I should say. And that dominant follicle is the one that actually kind of takes over. We don't exactly know why one uh, grows faster than the other six to 10 or 11 of those follicles just tends to happen and the other ones tend to degrade. Um, what you can see is that yellow structure inside is the actual egg or ovum. And on day 14, the luteinizing hormone goes up in spikes and that triggers the release of the egg that we call ovulation. It's a pretty cool story. Sometimes people will have one or two dominant follicles and both of them will ovulate and that's where you can think of like paternal or non-identical twins will develop from because you, then you release two eggs. Most of the time a female will release only one egg or ovulate one egg you could say there. And so that's kind of these two hormones to think about individually there. But at the same time, we have some changes in estrogen and progesterone. My favorite discussion about this is to show how estrogen starts to increase right before we have ovulation. Estrogen does a lot of things, like it's in charge of secondary sex characteristics, breast development during puberty, but during the menstrual cycle as well, this starts to, um, it will potentially increase sex drive or libido. And I always think it's funny and talk about with this with my students that it would probably make sense to increase the sex drive of a female prior to releasing an egg. You know, she may be more likely to overlook the shortcomings of her partner. Maybe he forgot to do the dishes or did something wrong. And, the estrogen just takes over and says, okay, I'll forgive you this time, but maybe not at the beginning or the very, very end of the cycle. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So kind of some cool things with estrogen from an evolutionary standpoint, as far as libido and sex drive, let's increase the likelihood of that occurring when we're about to ovulate. Then you'll see on the tail end of this chart, progesterone spikes. The reason progesterone is increasing is because progesterone will increase the thickness of the endometrium inside the uterus. Now, why in the world would we wanna do that? Well, just in case an egg gets fertilized, we want the endometrium to be nice and supple and ready for an egg or a fertilized egg to actually implant there. And that's the job of progesterone. And so what we're seeing here, and let me just kind of break some things down here. We had the follicular phase, which was up until a point day 13 or so. 
And the reason it's called the follicular phase is because these follicles are developing. And again, we typically have one follicle that takes over and releases the egg, that dominant follicle. And then we have this ovulatory phase that happens around day 14. And then we get the luteal phase from day 16 to 28. And that's because after the follicle releases the egg, it becomes what we call the corpus luteum. Luteum means, uh, corpus luteum means yellow body. And when they looked at this under the microscope, they thought it looked like this little yellow body or this yellow mass. And this is really important because what will happen with the corpus luteum is this structure, after it releases the egg, will actually secrete the progesterone and you see an increase in estrogen. And that's this whole idea of potentially getting ready for pregnancy. And what happens if a female does not become pregnant, the, the progesterone and the estrogen levels tank down, they drop. And the reason for that is the corpus luteum typically only has a life of about two weeks. And so you, as you can see, it lasts about two weeks and then degrades. And because it degrades, it's no longer secreting that progesterone and that estrogen. And look at this huge dramatic decrease in those two hormones. Many of you have likely heard of premenstrual syndrome and Hormones are a very powerful thing. They influence multiple physiological processes and also our mood, our behavior. And if you have a tank in that, if the hormones just dive down that dramatically and that quickly, it's no wonder that people can have feelings and emotions and things can actually, people can not feel as good and it can affect behavior. And so this is the physiological answer for why some people will experience premenstrual syndrome and some of the feelings and emotions that can come along with that. And then, once this happens, if pregnancy doesn't occur, we just start back over at the beginning. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of some of the basics of the menstrual cycle and how that works. One thing I do want to say, because we are going to talk about this in just a second, is if fertilization does take place and the egg becomes a zygote because it got fertilized by a sperm cell and it does implant in the uterus, that actually will sustain the corpus luteum throughout pregnancy and so it won't actually degrade. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a second. But I wanna come back to the cadaver dissection just to show you some of those, um, the processes that we have there. So here again is the ovary. And on day 14, remember we said that the ovary releases the egg from that dominant follicle. And what's really interesting about that is if you can look closely, this, the, the end of the uterine tube, it kind of looks fu fuzzy or almost looks like little flower petals. These little fuzzy little looking flower petals at the end of the uterine tube, they're called the fimbriae. And what these do will actually attract the egg into the actual uterine tube. So sometimes I show my students like, pretend my fingertips are the fimbriae. This is my uterine tube. Here's the ovary. You actually have one of the fimbriae that actually does attach to the ovary, but the rest are detached and they will flutter and it's almost like come to me egg and so it will do it in a creepy voice for some reason too but it pulls it in to the uterine tube and then that egg will move down and typically hangs out in the uterine tube until the other half of our story begins but the other half of that story is from the male reproductive system and we'll save that for a later video but we do have a free reproductive quiz pack that you can use to test your knowledge on the reproductive system and the link for that is in the description below so go ahead and check that out but thank you for watching and if you have ever spent any time in a uterus throughout your lifespan please hit that like and subscribe button and we'll see you in the next video